Oh, uh, everybody. The first two things we're going to talk about are the notes from our last meeting, pretty voluminous notes. And um, I would like to hear a motion to adopt or to adopt the notes. I move we adopt the notes. We're not calling it that. Correct. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? Call them minutes. Uh, yes, and I'm not, it, it, I'll give the answer to that to you. All I know is to call them notes. Okay. So, yeah. Do we any opposed okay we got two things done Perfect. Yeah. Uh, one thing, just so for a reminder for everybody online, um, the, here's a virtual meeting kind of reminder. Uh, the, the chat is not actively being monitored, but you can use the function if, if uh, you would like. We are recording those comments for uh, future reference, um, just so everybody is aware. Uh, and you, tonight's meeting will be recorded and posted on the Hub site, as always, uh, aacounty.org slash region four. We have a lot to go through tonight. Um, there will be all opportunities for Q&A sessions for about five five minutes or so after each presenter. If you have additional questions, and I'm sure you might, uh, please submit those to staff and uh, through the, the document I sent out this afternoon. Um, and I'll talk, I can talk more about that later, but any questions you have specifics to specific departments or specific presenters, please put that on there by May 9th. And then May 9th, I will send that out to the, to the uh, individuals, uh, and we can get you an answer for that. Anything you, anything you guys may have uh, after tonight. There's a Q and A, small Q and A. Small Q and A after each presenter. So, uh, and again, uh, all the contact information for everybody here tonight, um, as always. Uh, and then just really quick, uh, tonight's really going to be the first example of showing how this this region plan is one of the many gears of, of the greater machine. And we're working with other county departments to really kind of put everything together. Um, so this is the same chart, the same graphic we've seen. But tonight's going to be tonight moving forward is really going to be an opportunity to see how everything plays with one another. And um, when we have these discussions later on about potential recommendations and your ideas and your thoughts, keep that in mind. Keep in mind that, uh, that, that each department's information they present to you and how, uh, if there's any gaps in region four, what can what can we do to address those those gaps? Are there other things that haven't been mentioned that are important to you? How can we how can we provide recommendations to address address those as well? And I can talk more about that when we have a little mini opportunity to discuss that later tonight as well. Yeah, so we, we can, uh, I think it'd be a good idea to, uh, if everyone wants to go around and say their name just so everybody online can hear, because they cl clearly can't see everybody, but we can go around and, and absolutely do that. Yeah, we, 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 uh, we uh, Jesse and Lorenzo have been uh, keeping track of everybody who's here, so. And Eric, Eric, uh, I'm Lorenzo here. Just wanted to uh, give a reminder that since the microphone is placed towards Eric, uh, you that are towards the PowerPoint, if you uh, could uh, possibly speak up a little bit or get a little closer to this side, uh, the public at home is going to be hearing better. Uh, Eric, you uh, opposite of that. So since you're very close to the mic, if you want, <laughs> you can go a little lighter. Got it. Thank you. Um, 
keep on doing the work at home or video of the room. And this time I get to not break your voice. Thank you. All right, um, so without further ado, uh, first up, we have uh, the Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I believe uh, Jonathan will be presenting tonight. He is on, he's virtual. Uh, so Jonathan, if you wanna share your screen. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. It's coming up and saying, uh, I can't start screen sharing while, well, oh wait. Try that. Now I can, okay. Perfect. Why isn't Okay, uh, good evening. My name is Jonathan Boniface. I'm the research manager at Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation, uh, or AAEDC for short. AAEDC provides financing, technical assistance, regulatory guidance, and more to assist businesses of all sectors and sizes so that they can focus on their core mission and their business growth. Uh, we are a quasi-governmental uh, nonprofit organization focused on economic development in the county. And I want to thank you guys all for inviting me here uh, to present tonight. Using the most recent Census Bureau's origin, destination, employment statistics and local, employ or local employment dynamics data, in 2019, Region 4 was home to 26,748 primary jobs approximately 11% of the primary jobs in Anne Arundel County. By examining the commuter flows, we see that 68% of those working at jobs in Region 4 commute in from outside the Region 4 boundaries. The other 31% live and work in Region 4. Now, 87% of those employed residents of Region 4 work outside the Region 4 boundaries. The highest concentrations of Region 4's residents' jobs are located in Baltimore City, followed by Parole and Glen Burnie. And uh, you guys all know that Route 2, Route 100, Route 10, and 97 are major commuter routes uh, for Region 4 residents. Of those 63,050 residents employed in primary jobs, uh, we see that 14% earn less than $15,000 per year. About 21.7% earn between $15,000 and $40,000 per year, while almost two thirds make over $40,000 per year. Here are the statistics for those making less than $15,000 annually. We see that the largest category are those under 30 years old, and those that work in the retail trade and accommodation and food services industries. Looking at the statistics of those making between 15,000 and 40,000, we see that the largest category by age shifts to those between 30 and 54, and those working in the retail trade and healthcare and social assistance, social assistance industries followed closely by accommodation and food services. Of those making over 40,000 uh, per year, which is the vast majority, nearly two thirds are between 30 and 54 years old. And the predominant in industries are professional, scientific and technical services, public administration and healthcare and social services. Region four's proximity between Anne Arundel Medical Center and the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center make it an I ideal place for many uh, medical professionals and services. So where are the 26,748 primary jobs in Region 4 located? Well, we see uh, looking at this map uh, that the largest concentrations are along Route 2, Ritchie Highway, and Mountain Road. Many of these are retail businesses located there, and of course, the Anne Arundel County Community College. Looking at where those uh, working in Region 4 are commuting from, we see that many are local from Severna Park, uh, Glen Burnie, Arnold, and Pasadena, while the largest concentrations from outside the area are from Baltimore City and nearby towns in Anne Arundel County. Examining the jobs by their North American Industry Classification Systems, or NAICS codes, we see that educational services is the top industry, followed by retail trade, healthcare and social assistance, 
and the accommodation and food services, which are your hotels and restaurants. About uh, of the total or the total share of Anne Arundel County jobs, uh, educational services makes and in, in your region makes up thirty percent. Uh, for retail, they make up thirteen uh, percent. Health uh, care and social assistance, fourteen percent, and thirteen percent of the total Anne Arundel County jobs for accommodation and food services. Looking at the last 10 years of data for those top five industries, we see that job growth in these industries is especially high in the educational services and the professional scientific and technical uh, industries. On the next couple of slides, we examine the demographics of those working at jobs in region four. Here we break it down by earnings, sex, and age. Next, we break it down by race, ethnicity, and educational attainment. Using CoStar commercial real estate data, we see that Region 4 has a strong commercial real estate market with 664 properties with over 7.2 million square feet of space. The retail market consists of 390 properties concentrated mainly along Ritchie Highway, Route 100, and Mountain Road. The vacancy rate at 5.5% is slightly higher than the county average of 5.2% for vacant available retail space. Office space in Region 4 is mainly located along the same, those same roads. Uh, the 5.3% the vacancy rate is below the county average of 8.2% uh, of vacant available office space. Now the industrial market uh, is much scarcer in region four uh, and has a higher vacancy rate at 7.5% than that of the county of, as a whole, which is at 1.9%. As you can see on the map, the predominant location for industrial space is in the Northern part of region four and located along the major highway routes. Flex space, which is normally a combination of retail or office in the front and a warehouse in the back, is mainly located in the northern part of Region 4 and represents a small percentage of the total commercial properties for the region, which may account for the 1.7% vacancy rate being far lower than the 66 in the county as a whole. Now, Region 4 is also home to three of the many commercial revitalization districts within Anne Arundel County. Properties within the special district can qualify for certain tax incentives, and the Arundel Community Reinvestment Fund, uh, which we call ACR. Uh, there are ACR loans up to $100,000 that can be repaid over three to seven years at zero interest. Uh, if you know of any businesses in any of these uh, three commercial revitalization uh, districts that might be interested, please reach out to us at, here at AEDC. Now, one success story of a uh, uh, a, excuse me, of a commercial revitalization district is that of the Magathy Gateway uh, over there at Magathy Bridge Road and Route 2. Um, here you can see what it looked like before its revitalization. Anchored by uh, Harris Teeter, the strip mall was uh, completely transformed with the demolition of the old building and the construction of 90,000 square feet of retail and pad spaces. Upon completion, Magathy Gateway no longer needed it uh, needed to be a commercial revitalization district, and the area has flourished since. Now, one of the main economic or major economic drivers in Region Four is the uh, educational services industry, and none top Anne Arundel uh, Community College, which was uh, recently ranked the number one community college in the United States by Academic Influence in 2021. Um, AACC is home to over 1,300 jobs in Region 4. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, I will have uh, all the data uh, in a data report, which I can share with the, uh, the SAC, and also the, uh, this presentation and the transcript that goes with it. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Um, SAC members, we have about 10 minutes uh, of questions. Do you guys have anything? Um, and uh, don't, just remember again, uh, if we don't get to answer your question, uh, please write that down now 
and uh, submit it and we can send it out to Jonathan and his staff and get you an answer for that question at, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, Michael? Uh, Michael, I have a question about the commercial revitalization district. What, what, what was the process in deciding which area is going to be there? Was it high vacancy rate, history of how we designated like, uh, revitalization district? Eric, could you repeat that question back? I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, um, uh, essentially, what what were what were the criteria for being the re revitalization for what area, Michael? The commercial revitalization. The, the, yeah. What, what's the criteria for the ACR? Uh, mainly, it has to be uh, you have to use it to revitalize the property. Uh, basically, on the outside, you can do landscaping. Uh, you can do uh, you know fixing up the signage, repainting the building. It's basically, repairs to make to kind of beautify the outsides. Um, but all our uh, the requirements are listed on our website at aaedc.org and just go to the ACR and uh, community re revisal, uh, revitalization area and you can read all the requirements uh, there and definitely reach out to one of our staff. Uh, I can definitely put you through the financing um, or our business development staff and they can uh, go over uh, exactly what they need from you. If, if I could just... Clarify the question. It, it's not what the criteria for the loan, but how do you determine which areas are commercial revitalization areas? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's uh, determined by, I believe it was the county council um, passed a bill and they, they basically uh, put out which areas are commercial revitalization areas that are eligible for the uh, tax incentives. And they are visible on planning and zoning's website. Oh, John? Uh, hi. Hi, Jonathan. It's John Spencer. We met a long time ago, I believe, a couple of times. Yes. But anyway, uh, what I was wondering is the role of the Economic Development Corporation. Are you trying to bring in additional jobs in Anne Arundel County, or are you trying to upgrade the existing types of jobs that are here now? Uh, uh, what's your view of growth in Anne Arundel County? Well, I mean, we're, we're here to help businesses. Uh, uh, mainly, we are the constituent services for businesses in the county. And we're here to promote the growth of uh, businesses, help the businesses that are here uh, grow, help businesses get started. Uh, entrepreneurs, we have a lot of uh, them in the county that we help them. You know, somebody has a business idea and they want to start a business here, um, or they have a sole proprietorship that they want to grow into a, a brick and mortar. Um, we're here to help them. And uh, we also help with uh, major companies that are looking to relocate here, uh, find available space. If there's a vacant property that, you know, doesn't have a business in there and needs a business in there, um, we, we work with them as well. So you're not trying to actually go out and seek the additional job services. You're reactionary? Well, no, I mean, we're proactive as well. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky being in Anne Arundel County. Uh, most economic development uh, corporations around the country are actively looking for, you know, attractions, their number one thing. They go out and try to attract businesses. We don't have that problem in Anne Arundel County because businesses are naturally attracted to, to be here because of the Port of Baltimore, BWI, uh, being close to the water. We have, you know, three metropolitan areas of oh, Baltimore, Washington, and Annapolis, all within close proximity to each other. Um, so, we don't have to actually go out and actively seek as much as other counties would. Um, people are naturally attracted here. And when they are, they reach out to us and you know, we try to find them a home here in some of the areas, I mean, throughout the county that, are, that need, you know, need some vacant properties filled or um, if they wanna build in a certain area, um, if the zoning allows, uh, we can help them with the permitting process or you know, walk them through different things. Uh, I saw Steve. Jonathan, this is Steve Miller. First of all, thank you for such a great job in tailoring your presentation to Region 4. Uh, really excellent. And, and I say that after having taken a look at the general development plan and the three theme areas of uh, planning for the built environment, for healthy communities, and for healthy economy. I, I was struck by the number of times that I saw the Economic Development uh, Council uh, either a lead agency or a supporting agency 
for a policy or strategy. Uh, and so, you know, now as I take a look at some of the uh, things that you raised here in your presentation and the fact that there are more region planning going on than just us, uh, how is it that you're going to take these additional inputs on top of the load that you already have, particularly since so many of your strategies and policies are short-term solutions? What I, what I don't mean so short-term solutions, you have to get them done within five years. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, this is all. The, I mean, this is the input input uh, process. You know, we take uh, we're going to take all the different stuff from you know each of the different regions, all all of them, and you know compile that and see what we can do to you know better fulfill our mission in that plan twenty forty and uh, working with planning and zoning and all the other departments. Um, you know, our our sister uh, department with Workforce Development Corporation right now. You know, businesses are a huge thing where they can't find workers. You know, you go into a lot of these businesses and especially the small businesses and normally you have a couple of employees helping you or, but now, I mean, I walk into my region and I see the owner is helping me. And, you know, they're looking for job or workers like everybody else. And uh, so, I mean, we're kind of trying to tailor that and get all those things done, but but like you brought up, Steve, uh, the, the most important thing is the input from all the regions and then, uh, you know, basically tailoring that whole job to that and uh, helping each of those regions fulfill the mission as a whole. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. And then we have time for one more question. Uh, Lauren? Hi. Um, so I noticed it seemed like the majority of the confirmed is commute out of the and majority of households have a monthly income of um, 3,000 in order to work. So would you say that means there are fewer, like higher salary jobs available within Region 4 considering so many people are coming out? Um, if, I, if I got all that, it was a little hard to hear you, but I think you were asking um, if there are a lot more higher paying jobs, I should say, outside of the Region 4. Uh, if you saw how many people, I mean, 87% of the employees or of the residents uh, or working residents of Region 4 commute to outside. A lot of them go, you know, to, to Fort Meade, to, you know, uh, a lot of high paying jobs up in uh, Baltimore City. Um, so, yeah, if you look at your region and there's a lot of uh, retail, uh, which doesn't pay as high as uh, some of the uh, government jobs, some of the um, major employer jobs, you know, North of Grumman, uh, you know, some of the executive jobs so that a lot of people in Region 4 work at. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say there are less jobs at that pay level um, in your region than some of the others. Thank you. No uh, thanks, John. Uh, Jonathan. Um, and that will wrap that up and we'll move on to public schools. Again, if you guys have any additional questions that you uh, have now or you think of the next couple of days or, or a couple of weeks actually, um, write it in that Google sheet and I will submit it. Uh, Bo? Yeah, Bo, is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan, is that okay? Can you send me the presentation? I can send it out to- uh, uh, I'll have it to you in the next five minutes. Perfect, and then I will send it out uh, probably tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, and then for uh, public schools, uh, wherever you are comfortable. No longer first. <laughs> <laughs> my first planning and zoning meeting in two years has been in person. Okay. Would you like me to stand fit, or how, how do you guys want to do this? Yeah, the microphone. I don't have my back to anything and not get blinded by the young. I just saw my face for a second, so. Okay. And the floor is yours. <laughs> um, I'm Greg Stewart. I'm the uh, senior manager of planning for public schools. Um, just to give a little background, um, he's going to have, he's in charge of the power. So I think it's what. Um, Anne Arundel County is the 38th largest school system in the state of America by student health. A 
uh, we have about 14 million square feet of, of um, real estate back in the building and about 3,200 acres. Uh, we are a state agency of the state of Maryland. We're not funded by the county. Um, it's interesting this region four, when I first brought it up, um, I kind of listed the schools that are that are associated with it. I think I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> uh, so I, I basically try to map this now. I, I didn't understand the entire philosophy behind the four because for me, you know, it's so involved. Um, and what's interesting, there's four major high school peaks that are in this. However, there are peaks that aren't listed up in Freetown. This school actually goes to Glen Burnie. And over here, we've got a few schools that actually go south gate, which is that big purple, and also the bay, they go to Old Town. So technically, there's sort of features that are in this. So about 20 elementary schools, um, depending on how you count, um, five or six. Um, just the population of students that I have is you know, about thousand students. I think I can also mention about golf sports. For a lot of kids in this room. So that kind of gives you an idea of where, where schools are and again, it's a very diverse area. Um, go to the next slide and get I'm going to kind of go through fast and then get a question. What I did was I, I basically looked at all the schools, and this is elementary only. And we looked at the the actual 21. Sorry, the actual 21 is blue. We looked 10 years ago. What was the actual back in 2011? And then I looked what's our forecast. And the black bar represents the state rated capacity. So you can kind of see on some of these things like Arnold Elementary School, anybody knows the area, they just got a, a base a, a redo a new school. With that, there was added capacity. However, at the same time, Arnold's experience, even though there's not what I'm going to consider a lot of growth, there have been some townhouses built recently, not a significant number of homes being built. However, I did one there, there's a lot of turnover. Our older homes, older neighborhoods, people moved in and bringing in kids. So we're seeing changes in that. Those homes are different. Uh, we've got other ones, again, Benfield had a big addition, however. You know, a lot of times what happens in neighborhoods, people move in, your kids grow up, you don't move back. Sometimes they stay for 50 more years. We look at, um, we look at what's called a student factor. And we've done a few studies uh, countywide. We did one in 2015 where I actually broke down 77 elementary schools. And we looked at well, what's, how many kids are being generated from that, in that neighborhood, that area that goes to that school, goes to high school. We also recalculated it in 2018. And to give you an idea, there might be a school in Annapolis that might have a 0.06, or that's how many kids are coming out of house, very little, versus uh, maybe an area from somewhere in Park Down 44. Uh, we did a study in, in one of this townhouse neighborhood in Arnold at a 1.1. So you can see the difference. So what we try to do is when we look at future growth, we kind of use that factor. Um, one thing I did bring for those that have never seen it before, this is our educational facility master plan. We're required by state law to have this published every July. Uh, we're in the middle of the new one. This is last year's. It's a very thick document, double sided. It's about 500 pages. It's got everything you want to know about schools. It's got everything from square footages to uh, existing you know, conditions to future growth. And that's all in there. Um, when we get subdivisions, uh, we, the school system, do not approve subdivisions. No longer that regulatory. All we do is subdivision comes in and we say that subdivision goes to no longer in the process. What planning zoning does, they look at what's called the open close chart uh, for development. And they used to just look at it if it was open, if it was open by one seat, they were allowed unlimited development, thousands of units. That's happened around the county and still. still I was trying to play catch up on some of that. And Bill 1518, all was passed, and so they actually had to add it to that. But there were 100 seats available, they could take them. About 85% of those. Um, so we 
sort of fixed some of the loopholes, but we're still we're constantly still coming up. In some areas we've added six classroom additions up in one of these in the area. We've added six classroom addition, it would become open. Thousand units were approved. That would fill up. We would add another six classroom units for the schools of close to a thousand kids in all I've got a high school that has about a thousand kids in the county. Um, we're playing catch up in the west part of the county. If we take a country orchard, if we're reading about it, a few guys, but it's something we're dealing with. We're trying to catch up. We've got a little school. I've got an elementary school right now that's in about 960 kids. It's ready for 600. But the new school plan it hasn't even worked around, around yet, and it won't be ready until 2020. Affordable is doing what we can to do well. So, development has impacts on us. Try to work with the county on that tweet. So, anyway, going back to this, you kind of get an idea. Of, and sometimes you'll see like some of these schools that if you have an addition, you can kind of see where that jumps up. There may be some schools that actually. Decreases. Let's go to the next slide. You can kind of see that real clear. Um, like Chesapeake Bay Middle, for example, it's, it's decreased. We haven't done anything in Chesapeake Bay Middle. However, when we add programs for schools, uh, like a, uh, it could be a special ed program, regional special ed, we actually devalue the number of available classrooms. So we may make those adjustments as programs change. Um, same thing. And I have a question or a hand raise in that. No, just a, a reminder uh, from home. It's a, it's a little hard to hear. Uh, if you could go a little more slowly, uh, perhaps, and project. But thank you. Do my best. So typically, when when we look at schools, and again, we look at the synchronous capacity. That's our seat. We do look at that either if there's any changes um, in So, like say, in addition, we can add seats. If there have been program changes, there could be things that went from kindergarten. Uh, Half day full day, it's after capacity, right? Half day on top of the kindergarten class. Same thing, uh, we've got programs per week that also takes away a classroom. And so we had to reevaluate this. We've done that with a lot of schools. So you'll actually see some adjustments when that happens. And a lot of the other ones, like the open school renovation. Um, but again, the big drops. Chesapeake is in this region. The problem we have with Chesapeake, and again, this is just something happened in the county school back. 50 years ago, there was supposed to be a lot more development out of the county. Tremendous amount of development. So we, the county, overbuilt the schools. Uh, Just the middle is the identical school to the Agathy Seven Road. It's the exact same thing, nothing but except for me. And one sitting, I think it's about 1,300 kids, the other one's got over 2,000. I've got a lot of students. Um, high school standard it's underutilized. Um, we you know, with things, one thing we do, or you know, again, it's not really a lot of people don't like it. Uh, redistricting uh, before we can get state money, one of the options is we've got to look at redistricting. We are undertaking with any new high school. Some of you may have you know, heard about profit that opened up. I had to do redistricting. Um, we are we are building a new high school uh, on farm. So that's when that opens up, we will have to have a boundary for that. Um, with that, we are actually undertaking a comprehensive work. We have to best utilize these areas in areas that are overutilized, underutilized, and fun about that. Because the one thing to keep in mind, it costs about $55,000 per student. Elementary schools are first. Currently projected in our budget at about $50 million. Middle schools are pushing $100 million. High schools currently at about $190 million. A lot of money, a lot of infrastructure. And I've got 10,000 open seats. We have to be, again, it's the county taxpayer money in the state um, that we have to spend. And we we'll won't spend it if we don't have to. Not a pleasant thing, but that's a fiscal response. The other thing to keep in mind that what we face anytime we go for state funding, if the state looks at we're required by law to look at all these schools. And if, if 
say if I'm building a 500 seat elementary school and they look at all the adjoining schools and there are 400 open seats, they will only pay me for 100 seats. They basically say you can redistrict, you do not have to be for seats. So that's a fiscal thing we have to look at. Um, basically, if you go to the next slide, um, this is only the hand up. Quick question. Yes. Could you repeat which school you said it was overbuilt? Just, uh, I think from from all oh, Chesapeake Bay, but actually Chesapeake Bay Middle and Chesapeake Bay High School were built back in the um, 74, 75. And if you go back to history, the town was a lot of that land was going to be zoned a lot higher density. I think the town, I think, heard one say it produced like 10,000 lots. There's a lot, keep in mind, I mean, a lot of things have changed, critical area walk, there's been a lot of environmental changes, things like that. To bring sanitary service out, it never extended that way. There's a lot of ramifications. However, the county invests a lot of money, the county and state. We have a lot of seats. Um, so, you know, I've got some problems over on 14. I've got areas behind the secure zone. I can't get students in. So, again, that's something we, we're trying to figure out how to leave that utilized. Um, so this is just a quick little map. Um, again, I'm trying to talk to Mike. Uh, so these circles represent what I'm going to consider future assets. Um, some of these are under construction. We just acquired the um, this site, the blue site there is the Southgate Park. We used to belong to the school system. Just got it back. Um, and then we've got a few other middle schools with the Villages. Um, they've acquired a few sites here. There's a 75 acre site on the elevator by the county acquired for us. Um, this is a site here, about 15 acres of farm food farms, old turkey farms, acres. Supposed to be a school, was supposed to be built there many years ago. Uh, and what happens sometimes is Cost a lot of money to build a school. You know, 25 years ago, it was going about 13 million to build a school. Um, what would happen sometimes is you might not have the total enrollment. You've got some available capacity to be building schools. And we go ahead and we add a, a six classroom addition, a 12 classroom addition, because you know, it's easier to add a little addition than it is to build a whole school because you can, it's not just the capital cost, it's about 14500 and change per student per year. To educate. So it's keep in mind operating cost, it's not just capital cost for every, for every student. Um, so we have that school. We just acquired a site up here. It was actually the commercial site, it's just outside your region. It's um, actually a shopping center site on the market. It uh, wasn't going anywhere. And we had some negotiations. The developer was supposed to give us a site called school. Let's just say it fell apart. And we ended up having the D County had to buy the property from the um, On the Broadway Peninsula, there's actually two sites that we have here um, that are actual assets belong to the school system. Adjacent to the Broadway Elementary School is 55 acres. That's the south end of that, that site. It consists of roughly two 55 acre sites. Give you an idea that it's uh, currently at home. used to be a Farm out with it. Um, and then there's a 27 acre piece, uh, some of the Goshen Farms. Some of you know about it, but we currently have a lease to the uh, Goshen Farm Society. However, that is still an asset that we have. One thing to keep in mind the Seven River Magazine complex was built 50 years ago. 2040 plan by then, it will be 70 years old. We typically start replacing schools for 50 to 60 years. So this is just something. It's an asset that we have, the school system. Um, but besides that, we're in pretty good shape. Um, you know, again, a lot of the area, I mean, continues to change. Um, you kind of react a lot. You have to react to what's going on. Uh, again, every, think of it this way, about every 3,000 homes, depending on the student yield factor, generates an elementary school. So by zoning, Average. So if you multiply and say an elementary school should be 500 seats, you know, you can do math and it comes out to be roughly that. So 
almost say 3,000. So, so we've proven 3,000 units. Big thing gas is where's the elementary school in place? Every few, you know, every few of those in the middle school or high school. And I, I'm not opposed to development. The only thing is, is as areas get changed for zoning, and we have higher density, we have to make sure that we're setting aside. Libraries again, back to my old days in the county, I used to build the libraries for the library for the fire department. Back then, I was well, finding land after the fact. Um, we have a school that was kind of interesting when I was doing some final work on the school. Back in the late 50s, the sound of the school system went and purchased over 100 lots. They were existing homes. We and that was something I think the county got very smart after that. So that was not a good thing to do. Um, so what was interesting is after that 1960s, and I even had bills from you know the attorneys that said, you know, for condemnation, it's like fifteen dollars for a lot. I think it's probably a lot more now than that. Um, but there were hundreds of them that they had to condemn there. I have this flat that shows all the different all the different all the big flat. And so sometime later, the county got smart and bought, you know, that's when we bought the Chesapeake complex. They bought Broadneck, they bought South River, they bought the Crofton site. They were buying up, basically getting those big parcels, trying to get ahead of the curve. Unfortunately, for almost 40 years, they stopped doing it. And they actually stopped being smart about it. Um, last administration. Kind of pushing to try to say, hey, guys, we've got to get some of this land. Acquire another high school site, try to put about 70 acres. 60 more acres. The administration took the most of it. 90 acres of typical high school is on that for example. Uh, big what was that? No, uh, no, you don't have to look that easy. So you got about 10 minutes of questions if you might want to go ahead. Sir. I, I was an old timer. I, I was blessed. What is this? And I assume that's like a dirty word now. Um, so the county doesn't do any busing. Like I, I lived in Sorin Park. Northeast High School was built. There was no junior high in Savannah Park. After two years, I went to Northeast High School. Well, I, I can tell you, you the people who live there in South County, they say they're being bust because the travel distance is so far in some of these areas. Um, you know, we try to find you know, the closest school, right? But there are times, we'll, you know, again, map will show there's not the cleanest boundaries, uh, you know, like gerrymandering. Like Professional district. Um, so it's still we're not that bad, but yeah. but what we what we're doing and again right now I have a consultant on board for redistricting and, and part of that was was the actual tables you put in. You know, you know where all the students live, and they can actually you don't know everybody. Say what's the travel distance and what's the redistricting? And how does that does that change the amount of money? So there's ways to do that, and I can tell you that people always ask this. I, I get calls a lot of my staff gets calls a lot about you know, hey, people are living in the house where they going to go to school. The closer you are to the school, the better chance you have to go to that, that school. However, give me a good example. Anybody's familiar with Lake Shore Elementary School? You know where it is? There's a driveway that goes up to Lake Shore Elementary School. Those two houses that are on the driveway, good luck. <laughs> That's how close they are. And, you know, a number of years ago, they tried to redistrict them to put them in the right school. It failed. Um, we are now dealing with an elected board. It's even interesting. Broadneck, you know, those who live in Broadneck, anybody in Broadneck here who live in and Cape St. Clair. So, uh, again, we we thought, now, now again, I'm, not, look, I'm an engineer, so it's me, Matt. Uh, Broadneck Elementary was 200 seats over. Or, no, yeah, it was 100. Minutes. 200 seats over, Cape St. Clair easily had, you know, plenty of room, 200 seats. And I was trying to move 100 kids. Try this twice, failed twice. 
and all it was was one basically two buses. You take a left and set up road. That's current board, and it fit. And again, it was for us, we're lucky enough again. I'm the dumb staff that gets up to the board and makes a lot of decisions to then approve the things recommended. But the board makes the final decision on what's happening. Some people think, well, it's just so it's development and things like that. It's not development. One thing you have to understand, even if the school is closed, they can wait six years and it's going to come. Can I follow up on that? Just Tom Hampton again. Um, with the Chesapeake system having such a, a low population, is there no way that either on a temporary basis, I mean, I, I was I was bused for two years, so I know it's not before, but a long time ago. But is there no way that they can take advantage of those empty seats at two schools? Yes. It hasn't happened. happened. It hasn't happened yet. Um, let's just say maybe in a recommendation, but <laughs> but it's up to the board to make that decision. And I can tell you that redistricting is a, is a very emotional process. I mean, I've been through, you know, I've been through a few. I did Annapolis twice. I did Crofton once. I've done in Broadneck twice. This one's. Will be one of the largest redistricting this county has ever seen. Um, I, you know, when I first started it, I said, let's just do the whole county. I walked through this at one point. So I'm like, nobody's going to be happy because I can tell you the thing about redistricting, you have to understand it's a dominant system. And I may say that, you know, you need to go to this next school and you need to go to the next school just because of the way that we got to move kids around and balance. And all of a sudden, you find out that dance. There. And I'm like, wait a minute, Ann doesn't go, then there's no room, and the whole thing just collapses. And uh, you know, when I did Annapolis, I expected 12,000 students, so we had to work part of it, uh, ended up with about 3,000. But it, again, it's this whole dominant system. And we were doing the whole thing like you said, transportation, we were bringing the neighborhood schools because there, were, there was cost saving that. Historical, there's a lot of stuff that we don't apply. I'm going to ask that panel to figure it out. We're just saying it. this is how we do it. If you're the keeper of the plan, I want to just ask a more question about us. So, my understanding is that uh, when the decision was made to move up or to move back to start time to high school, it actually complicated the bus situation. It became less efficient. And you had to use more buses uh, to be able to affect that. And everybody's concerned about the congestion on the roads. And I live off of College Parkway, so I watch the parade that comes out of the farms and high school and so forth. Are you measuring, uh, will you be measuring the impact of making that decision in terms of uh, buses to school? Uh, you know, they, they have to. And first of all, they contribute more to the estimate of the roads, and then also they potentially slow down uh, the arrival of the bus. I, I, guess, I don't think that that story is, is evident. I mean, yeah, I know. I know. Let's put it this way I'm a planner. I knew one of my friends in transportation, and I consulted that their computer said that was. Because <laughs> I know it's, 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 it's not just that, you know, it's not any secret. I mean, most of you probably heard about the school bus drivers. Yes. We lots of them. Mm -hmm. So we've got equipment issues. Um, we also think of it this way we just do run buses. So that's a new one. They're at rushing afternoon. Seven mixing bowl. I mean, there's there's some things that um, it's going to be an interesting start this year. But again, that's I, I assist transportation. I mean, we we work with them on the district day. I get involved. Uh, I can tell you right now, it's been this has been a very challenging. What I'm going to say, years with COVID, a lot of parents. Um, I, matter of fact, I was just at Broadway. Here, 
Broadneck High School. Uh, at the end of this morning, I was asked to take a look at Broadneck. My kids went here many years ago now. Um, I remember when they missed the bus, I had to drive them. And I was stuck out in California. I tell every parent, any parent who complains, that you only put your kid on the bus. Because the problem here, the traffic is the parents, not the kids. <laughs> the parents. Um, and, it, and it's not just here, it's every single elementary school. And with Cody, the kids, the parents didn't want to go on the bus, or they didn't want their little child to stand out in the cold or in the rain. Or the, and in a few schools, just, you know, again, I, I've been around long enough, and they're one of the local schools I can say a local school they were complaining about parents and the traffic and i said they called me up and i said well i tell you what i'm going to look at the weather forecast i said thursday's going to be came out and i'm like oh my god it's perfect there's no traffic i came out this day again it's raining things like that every parent is driving their kid the biggest i even tell the school product i said just put up a sign Get on the bus. Don't complain. Get on the bus. I mean, that's really what the issue is. And it's everywhere. It's at every single school. Um, it doesn't matter. High school, middle school. I mean, we've got, I was out of the school today. School was out at four. Three o'clock, they were already locked up. It's like, and if they showed up at 301, they would have just driven through because we can clear a bus lot in a matter of minutes. Broadneck High School, 2,200 kids. Buses can be out of there in six minutes from dismissal. That's how quick it is. What percentage of students take buses? If that it, seems like a it, problem, it, we it have depends, these huge schools, and then the so other. many kids have to take the bus because they can't walk there. So then we have the bus problem, and then we can't start schools later, which really does affect high school students. I have a high school mm -hmm. senior. So it's, I mean, it's all interconnected. Well, I mean, again, I used to think of this way. Walkers, elementary, kindergarten half mile, elementary four mile, secondary is a mile and a half. That's, that is small, but that's that's in our policy. That's in the rest. Um, and with this whole thing, with the busing part of that, instead of, say, trying to get through a whole neighborhood where they used to do it now, they can say, wait a minute, I can save five minutes. I'll pick up here and here. People in the neighborhood can all walk out to a gathering. Right, but then when it's raining, they're not going to do that. So then you right. have that problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, things are different. I mean, my, I, went, I rode a bus when I was a kid. I didn't think anything of it. My parents were just going on work. If I the bus, I'm walking. I said, I'm walking. Um, my kids, you know, and they, they missed the bus if they had something like a science project, fine, I'd drive Really, the big problem now, parents, and, and you, you can walk. You walk in school if you have a safe route to school. Walk where you're on public. We provide public transportation. So all the cars that are there. You know, I mean, some of them are real bad in the morning, and it, it, a lot of times it depends on the hours in school because you know, if your the schools it's like seven thirty. You, know, you drive by there at seven thirty. Most people have seen the project of eight hundred kids at one time. And I swear there's like 750 cars that are coming in because you know it was at that time that hey you're going to work anyhow you can drop the kid and then they can complain to me that oh you need to put in another bus to get there. So I know there's a few extra questions, uh, but we're we're short on time for tonight. Uh, Holly, Holly is last. She's a Metro team member. She's been patiently waiting with her. And race, so she wanted to ask a question, I believe. Yeah, we uh, we have to keep it moving. Uh, so if if you get, I know Bo had a question, and Josh saw John's hand as well. Uh, just please submit your question on that Google Doc sheet I emailed out this morning, uh, and we will send that to Greg, and we will get an answer for you there. Uh, I appreciate you all for being patient. I, I, we just have a lot to go through tonight, so thank you. Uh, and next we have uh, libraries. <laughs> Right there. Thank you. Did you get this yes, absolutely. We're going to get a sound check. I think we're good. We're good. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah. So good evening. I'm Rudy Rodella. I'm the library's chief technology officer, and I'm presenting the library's part in uh, Plan 2040. But first and foremost, I just want to thank y'all for being back in our libraries. We have missed you, and we're glad to be here again. So thanks for thanks for being here tonight. Uh, next slide. So here's a quick snapshot of the library, the scope and scale of the library as uh, one of the business units for the county. Uh, for our most recent complete fiscal year, our budget was 21 million, 24.5 of that came from the county. So, you know, in terms of uh, our other partners like the college and the schools, we're kind of small potatoes, but we have a great big bang for the buck. And for me, what sticks out on this chart is that uh, 47.75 per capita. So for about four bucks per person per month, and Arundel County residents can enjoy access to 750,000 books, DVDs, audiobooks on CD, free Wi Fi in our buildings and in our campuses, educational programs, streaming movies and music, millions of magazine articles, and the list just goes on and on. It's a, and it's also a pretty good place just to hang out and spend a good Saturday afternoon. It's a good bargain in my book. The map on the, on the right there shows the county and those little shaded areas are the census block groups. Those are the little constituent uh, areas that make up a census tract. And the darker they're shaded, the more dense the population is in that area. So overall, looking at the map, we're in pretty good shape facility location-wise. Our libraries are where they need to be, uh, with one exception, and that's Region 3. It's a little underserved, but we do have a plan for that in the Capital Improvement Plan in for fiscal 28. Next slide. So all of our services are guided by Strategy 2023, which we developed in October of 2018. Our vision, we see Anderola County as a welcoming, resilient community where all can realize life to its fullest potential. And to, to realize that vision, our purpose, what we used to call our mission, is educate, enrich, and inspire. And this strategy asks us to focus on these five areas. Now, the nice we, and by we, I mean not just me as library leadership, but library staff overall, top to bottom, we have been thrilled and, and grateful to be working with this plan because these focus areas are actually interrelated. They're not siloed the way the old plans used to be. And for example, uh, the focus on better, better access, tailored services, entrepreneurial staff and effective partnerships is key to our response to the uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. So um, during the pandemic, libraries like everybody else pivoted. We became distribution points for test kits and masks. To date, we've distributed over 126,000 test kits and 260,000 masks. We also partnered with County Health and other agencies to provide vaccine clinics at 14 of our libraries. Two pictures in the middle you see there are at Brooklyn Park and at Annapolis. And through our philanthropic partners, we expanded our Wi-Fi hotspot kits, providing internet access to bridge the still persistent digital divide. Now, we don't do it all, but we connect it all. In the lower right, you see last July's ribbon cutting for the Community Pantry of Discoveries, our outlet at, West Annapolis, at Westfield Annapolis Mall. They collect donations of diapers, baby wipes, and other hygiene items to distribute to families. Families don't, show, don't have to show need, and it gives us the opportunity to promote library services. So all of this, go ahead demonstrates the vital irreplaceable role of public libraries as social infrastructure. Now, this, this is an idea that was articulated by Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist at NYU in his book, Palaces of the People. Now, this is an idea, the social safety net is not the European social safety net idea, but a unique framing of the need for common non-commercial spaces that support and encourage community bonding. At its core, people need a safe place to be with each other, to make friends and meet neighbors, to create all those channels and structures that are the connective tissue to a vital, safe, resilient, and future-proof community. The library is all this and more. 
people in place magically create this platform for all these aspects of community building and, and interaction. So this topic is easily an hour long uh, seminar or a podcast. This is just the, the top view of it. And I'll give you a link to some other information later on. Okay. So for us, for the library serving region four, we're lucky we have four libraries serving the region and almost all of their service areas are entirely within region four, which is kind of an oddball uh, when you look at the library, at the library system overall. So the map shows uh, the service areas for Riviera Beach, Mountain Road, Severna Park, and Broadneck. The service areas are self-selected by customers. And again, they're based on the census block groups. So they show which library the people who live in that particular area prefer to use. The Libraries Facilities Master Plan and Anne Arundel 2040 set a goal of 0.5 square feet per capita for the county overall and for each region. And uh, there you go, thank you. So overall, we are a little bit short in this region, but as I mentioned earlier, we have a neighboring, library, a neighboring region, region three, that is slated to get a brand new library in the Millersville area. The design for that begins in FY28. And we anticipate that the service area for that area will, will bleed into region four, should bring us up to the overall 0.5 square feet uh, per capita that is our goal. Now, during the next FY, we're also gonna be looking at uh, getting a new facilities master plan and looking closely at the feasibility of expanding or perhaps renovating more, more thoroughly this library that we're in right now. We do have a little bit of opportunity here. And as you see, we're slightly underserviced uh, as far as the goal of what we, what we were aiming to be. If we're trying to get 0.5 square feet per capita, not just for the, uh, for the county overall, but also for each library and its service area. Uh, two red flags there, Mountain Road and Broadneck were both rated as poor in the last facilities master plan. Now this uh, last plan was done three years ago. So the assessment for this building was a little old. As you can tell, we've done a little bit of work since then. We've got new carpet here and on the main floors. We fixed a couple of le uh, leaks in the roof and we've uh, um, reconfigured the service area. So we anticipate, we anticipate the next uh, facility smash plan is gonna make this building much, much better than what it was before. Mountain Road is another story though. Mountain Road, we have had uh, significant difficulties maintaining that it's in a leased space. So there is some responsibility with the landlord in that area that we have not been able to resolve. Uh, this year, the Board of Library Trustees elected not to renew that lease. So we'll be moving Mountain Road in the next fiscal year. We're gonna be looking for a new place um, somewhere along that peninsula, not too far away, but commercial space in that area is hard to come by. So we're gonna be looking at that very carefully. Again, with the new facilities master plan, we're also gonna be looking at perhaps leveraging other county properties uh, for future construction. But that's, again, that's a lot of money that goes into that. So that planning is gonna to have to be deferred for the next cycle. Uh, okay, next slide. So that actually is the, some of my presentation, short and sweet. Uh, these links will be made available to you. That's where all of our plans, all of our detailed plans, so all the text behind the strategic plan, our facilities master plan, uh, are there at that link, along with our community impact plans. So you'll be able to take a look at that. If you want to get more ideas about the more and more background about what library and social infrastructure, there's a podcast there from 99% Invisible and a seminar from uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design uh, with Eric Kleinenberg. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting talk. It's it's long, it's an hour long, but it's well worth the time, I think. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, Bo? Yeah. Uh, Bo Green. Um, my question revolves more around the strategic planning. What lessons did you learn? There's kind of a two-pronged question. Sure. But what lessons did you learn by utilizing the Atlas Mall as a location you know, in commercial development, use of space, and taking advantage of reprioritizing uh, existing commercial space for your use? So we always had that idea about 
that we are not married to the bill by own bond. Uh, so we are looking very closely at, at um, whenever we, we look at new spaces to, re to leverage existing commercial space as library spaces. Um, I gave the brief for region two last week. Uh, that region is a little, has a couple of underserved areas as well. Uh, we're looking at some space in the Ar Arundel Mills area in, in, for a future library. Yeah. Again, that, that's gonna be something that the next facility smash plan will address, but that's definitely on our radar. Yeah. Second piece of that is, is there anything in strategic planning that you guys are doing now to talk to the other departments of the county, like say schools, to sell this to them if that was your money in existing buildings that can be rehabbed easier, reduce where traffic goes, to open up more additional county lands for future schools, police, fire. So I'm not going to throw my predecessor under the bus. I'm not, this, this is just this is a new day. Okay. Yeah. This is a new day. There's a new focus on where we, the library, fit into the community and to the county. Yeah. Um, you know, before the current library administrator, before my boss took over, they did their things things their way. There was a library and then there was everything else. Right. My boss and our current administration, we see ourselves as integral to the county. So the next facilities master plan is definitely going to involve, oh, he's not here anymore. It's going to involve the, the school planner okay. because he said a couple of things tonight that I think, you know, raised my ears a bit. There's some space that, and some opportunities that are available to us that maybe we didn't look at before that we're going to be looking at now. I know is the police and all the local and fire departments look for more localized spaces as the county gets larger. We're going to need more police districts. So the building of this size to be rehabbed or replaced with this or police station down this other peninsula rather than served by the Pasadena in the future. And trading buildings and counties. And yep. I just want to make sure someone's talking about it somewhere. Here is the focus on something. You're singing my song there, sir. Because okay. uh, uh, when so Glenn Burney is up for rehab too. We weren't able to make it happen, but we were looking at some space across the way and let the police department come into the old building. Okay. You know, that didn't work out this time, but that's definitely a strategy that we'll be looking at. Um, I guess over the last 15 years, the growth rate in Arnold County has been like between 7% or give or take. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Do you use that in your calculations, like you're saying, that you're going to have, that's 4,000 people coming into the county each year. Absolutely. And in schools, it was, I'm sorry, I was confused at the public facilities. I totally got confused about how they're projecting where the city's going to go. It sounds like we may have an easier way to do I think we're kind of doing the same way. We have, so we, we project out uh, through the capital plan, so the six years out. Um, and we, we did the backward regression. We looked at what growth was before most recent uh, five years and then project that forward. And the furthest out we go on, on and we do project by census block group so we can get a little, uh, some granularity on where we want to look and, at putting a new library. But after five years, we just, it gets a little fuzzy after that. So we, we just uh, use a straight flat. So, uh, I believe last time it was 5%, I put that up. But we do project out by group, by census block group, by area, to estimate where we're going to be in 2030. And then that's where we start putting our capital request together. Do you use the zoning like an R5 versus an R22? We don't, we don't get that deep, no. Because um, our experience with libraries is that the closer you are to a library, the more it gets used. Mm -hmm. So we try to find, we, we try to look for just the density of the population. Wherever there are more people there, we want to put that library closer to it. There's, there's not a lot of available public land there. So that's, that's why it's, it's a good opportunity for us to get into commercial space. Mountain Road. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, it, it obviously doesn't have all the stuff that a suburban park like has. Modest, I, very modest IT, uh, no periodical. If you build a new facility, it may, what, what I did not see in your strategic plan, I saw a lot about facilities, facilities related to the total population and stuff, but I didn't see anything about actual usage. Did I miss that in, in the plan? Um, and, and do you think that if you build another facility for Mountain Road, that you will actually increase because you have the ability then to add things that Suburban Park has right now, which is a very active library? So we designed, 
So again, this there's a, and this is referenced in our uh, in the um, programming document for the Annapolis Library. That was the first library that we'd built in 14 years, and it represents a quantum shift from the way libraries used to be built. We used to go to the architect and tell them, we have 14,000 books, you know, tell us how, how big the library is going to be, and then they take it from there. We don't do that anymore. We build a place for people now. So we focus primarily on gathering the community, asking them what they need, and then building the library program from that. So what we're doing with Modern Road right now is, is kind of temporary because we need to get out of that space. So we're, we're trying to just copy that library and put it in a new place. Again, with a new facilities master plan, if that points to us needing a new, a new permanent building there in, in, that, in Modern Road, then we're gonna start that planning process all over again from the very beginning. Gathering the community, asking them what they need, and then developing the plan from that. Um, does that answer your, does that get close to what you're looking for? No, so, as I said, I, I understand the relationship between home population and square footage and like that. But the question is how much the library actually you can. If I take a look oh. across the, the, the numbers of people that not only come in the facility, but as you laid out, you know, your different sections of the library and stuff, where are they going? And, uh, and, and Mount Road, Definitely looks like it's, it's a pretty quiet place. It is small. It is. Um, we, so how are you going to attract people to that facility by building or creating another? Yeah, I mean that, that's a that's a good question. So I think we're in the same situation that a lot of other public facing institutions are right now. The pandemic has really crushed the way people behave around libraries and the way people socialize. Our whole model is built on bringing people into the building. And that is, that's different now. Um, so strategy 2023, 20, we did that pre-pandemic. We actually did the programming for that three and a half years ago. Yeah, and we'll be doing another strategic plan in 24. It's gonna be a time for us to really sit and think about how and what we're providing for the public and how it's being used. So that is a question I can't answer right now. It's something that's that bright, big thought on our radar that says that this, this is something we have to look at and address in our future plans. We are hoping that, that the bounce back comes. I mean, we are seeing a rise. So we're seeing a rise in our visits. They're only 40% of what they were pre-pandemic. Our circulation is back to pre-pandemic levels. It is, it's, people use us all the time, but they use us differently. So we have to fold that into what, uh, what we're gonna be doing in the future. It may very well be that libraries are smaller in the future, but the things that they'll have, the amenities that they'll have, people still need. You know, you go into a Starbucks and when you get asked by the clerk there, can I help you? What they really want to know is, do you want to spend eight bucks for a latte or four bucks for a coffee? And sit down here, feel free, so I can upsell you the twelve dollar panini. Right? You go into a library and they ask you, "Can I help you?" They really mean that. They mean, "How can I make your life better?" So that secret sauce, I think, you're never ever going to replace. You're still going to need a place for people to have. You're still going to need that place for people to be able to come and try and make themselves better. Just to be that, just to be, just for 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 that so for its own sake. So libraries might suffer aren't going to go away. How we do things in the future may be a little different, and you know we're a little worried about that. We're looking at that. I just want to say quickly. Um, I used to be in the museum field, and we were talking about the fact that libraries are so so much more welcoming than museums. Museums are don't touch. You know, <laughs> and we don't know this, but we do. So libraries are really place where people feel comfortable. My mom is a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, thank you, Rudy. Uh, if you guys have any questions, again, submit it and we will we will send it to you. Thank so, you. And thank you for having us at your facilities. So we appreciate it. Uh, the next presentation we have is from the Office of Emergency Management.
if you would like to uh, share your screen, Preeti. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Right. Um, for some reason, I can't um, start my video. So, um, where did this go? All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Preeti Emrick, and I'm the director of the Anne Arundel County Office of Emergency Management. Thank you for having me here to talk about what our office has done and definitely how we're trying to meet some of the goals and plan 2040 and our strategic view for the next couple of years. So just a little bit about emergency management. There are four phases. Um, first, Mitigate, we're trying to prevent future emergency or at least minimize their effects. Preparing, taking actions ahead of time because we know that an emergency is gonna happen. So we wanna make sure that our county agencies and our communities are ready for that emergency. Respond, when the unfortunate happens, obviously we wanna protect life and protect property. And we assist our first responders and other folks on the scene in doing so. And then recovery. Recovery is such a huge thing. And recovery can take many, many years, whether you take examples like Hurricane Katrina or even COVID-19. Rebuilding from an incident that really um, um, redefines your life, redefines the activities, um, it takes a while. And some people talk about returning to normal or sometimes returning to a new normal. And all of these four phases of emergency management, we use the whole community approach. Um, none of this can be done without our county agencies, without our external stakeholders, and especially without community members. We test and train and exercise with our partners. Our emergency operation, excuse me, my, our emergency operations plan is all hazards. Obviously, we cannot control when or where the disaster strikes, right? So we identify the emergency support functions and roles by the agencies and departments, but also our external stakeholders that are necessary to, to protect the life and property. We also have methods of coordinating and receiving assistance from state and federal partners. And again, when we talk about the all hazards approach, it doesn't matter what the hazard is, we have the framework for coordinating and managing those activities, whether it's in the four phases or whether we talk about a long-term recovery. And again, all hazards, it goes from the fire that may happen in a residential house to a hurricane. We still utilize that same framework. All this coordination takes place in our emergency operations center. Here is a picture of it. Um, and we, this is where not only county agencies, but some of our external stakeholders like the American Red Cross, BGE have a seat um, at the table, so to speak right as the incidents occurring or in the recovery. So we can get the most up-to-date information and the resources that we need. And again, our main goal is to provide this oversight to, to have minimal disruption across all levels of county government, but also to make sure that we effectively and efficiently help our community members. So what I wanna focus on, especially with Plan 2040, and we talk about land use is mitigation. Um, this is a quote from the state of Maryland um, Department of Emergency Management. Mitigation is the center of the universe. Um, the Office of Emergency Management is responsible for the development and execution of our hazard mitigation plan. So the hazard mitigation plan really assesses the natural hazards and risks that affects our communities. And especially if you're talking about the region, you know, flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, assessing those natural hazards, and then what's the extent of it that that will happen, the likelihood and frequency, and then what mitigation actions and capabilities can the county take to reduce the risk to human life, property, critical infrastructure, and facilities. And we have to be honest in our assessment, right? Um, we can't say, yes, we can handle everything and just leave it at that. We really have to identify what is our capability and what is the risk of the event happening. And it is mandated to have a hazard mitigation plan. Um, it's required for any um, disaster assistance and for FEMA grants. So with this hazard mitigation plan, we could not do it without a team. 
without that coordination. And we have a lot of different departments and stakeholders are involved in it. And you can see the agencies representing land use, public safety, on the administrative side. Without these entities, we cannot do our hazard mitigation plan because there's so much that goes into not only land use, but the, how that affects public safety. When a disaster hits, there's so many different resources and entities that go into the response and recovery. But the one thing we're trying to really lean forward in is getting that involvement from the private citizens, community associations, and neighborhood groups, because these events affect you, it affects the community. And having that feedback on what we could do in terms of our capabilities to help the community is really what we need to focus on. Our next hazard mitigation plan update is in 2025, and we're definitely gonna be using platforms to engage communities more. Now, as part of this hazard mitigation plan, we do have the hazard identification and risk assessment because we have to understand what hazards and risks um, that, uh, that befall Anne Arundel County. Um, and especially for the region, um, we talk about the hazards that, pro that pose the greatest risk. So I'm just gonna read some of these off. Coastal and riverine flooding, severe thunderstorms and hailstorms, hurricane winds, severe winter storms, tornado, and of course erosion, whether that's the effect of these hazards and what is left behind. And this shouldn't be a surprise uh, to Region 4, but flooding was identified as the most common natural hazards affecting our communities. With an extensive coastline, it is not surprising. So in terms of we've identified what is the thing that most impacts us? What's the hazard? And that's flooding. So what can we do to build that resiliency? What can we do to build our capabilities? So there's a couple of things. Number one, strengthening the building codes and land use policies. Number two, which is really what the Office of Emergency Management does in terms of Plan 2040 and some of our goals, is preparing people, property, critical facilities, and infrastructure to withstand and rebound from the potential impacts of disasters. Again, not only county agencies, but communities and other stakeholders. As you can see, I just wanted to give you the numbers that match kind of the broad categories that I gave. As you can see in red, those are the natural hazard events affecting the county 1950 to 2018. The ones in red are the most likely, the highly likely. And those are the ones I listed, but I just wanted to give you context with the numbers of what has happened, flooding 131, um, um, coastal flooding, which I'm not sure it's not highlighted for some reason, but that is again, also highly likely, um, severe thunderstorm and hailstorm, winter storm, tornado, and of course, the erosion. I wanna highlight two incidents that have happened recently that I've known have affected region four. Um, first of all, the Ida, tropical storm Ida and the EF, to tornado that had happened in September, 2021, and the coastal flooding, October 28th through the 31st, 2021. Um, that was a very obviously active fall for the Office of Emergency Management, but for your region as well. And for Ida, we had a local declaration, um, state of emergency, and for the coastal flood event, a state um, declaration of emergency. So tropical storm Ida, it was an EF2 tornado. Um, again, spanning the areas from um, Lothian to the Severn River, and the greatest impacts were in Edgewater, West Street, City of Annapolis communities. And it, it was interesting in that, you know, Edgewater being the residential, a lot of damages to houses, but then you go to West Street, City of Annapolis, it was a lot of businesses. So we were dealing with two different communities, two different needs. Businesses to get their economic <laughs> um, recovery on track, and of course, to make the community whole again, because home is important, land is important, and to give that sense to the community to rebuild quicker. And then we had the substantial coastal flooding. Uh, you know, we hadn't seen floodwaters like this in a very, very long time. Again, the largest tidal flood event expected in 10 to 20 years. Um, state of emergency declared by the governor, uh, what we saw along the shoreline, the coastline was extensive damage to piers, shoreline structures and bulkheads. And, you know, knock on wood, it could have been a lot worse. And we were prepared for the worst, obviously, with our EEOC activated. Um, but again, when you have damage to land, and these are people's property, 
um, there's still recovery that has to be done. So this is a lot of text, I don't expect you to read it, but I think it's really important to understand coastal flooding, right? What makes it so dangerous is the storm surge combined at high tide, right? And we need to identify the populations and geographical areas that will potentially be affected. And this helps us obviously notify the public of impending hazards, when to do mandatory and uh, voluntary evacuations. And when you talk about evacuation, I, you know, that's something that we don't take lightly, obviously. That's asking people to leave their homes, leave their stuff behind um, for their life safety and for their property safety issues. Um, so that's not a decision we take lightly, but that's something obviously as part of Plan 2040, we're working on improving in terms of evacuation routes and coordination. Climate change, a sea level rise. Um, you know, there's a lot of been studies done um, on communities along the coast in Anne Arundel County and how um, the coastline is being affected by climate change, a sea level rise. The Office of Emergency Management is coordinating with um, planning and zoning, zoning, excuse me, Department of Public Works to understand how climate change, a sea level rise affects our infrastructure, right? And how we could um, help the lands obviously build up that natural defense in terms of what is becoming increasingly stronger storms. Um, and definitely on the state and federal level, future mitigation projects are being um, um, prioritized um, with that understanding that um, there's a lot of stronger storms coming and what we can do to make our land better. So we talk about disaster resilience. We talked about community disaster resilience. There's also individual disaster resilience. Um, you know, it's not if it happens, it's going to happen, whether it's a hurricane, tornado, et cetera. And how can we effectively manage and implement our plans and coordinate with state, federal, and local partners? And for the next couple of slides, I'll, um, I wanna go over a little bit of the disaster resilience policies and plans that the Office of Emergency Management is currently working on. One of them is to pursue BRIC funding. This is a federal grant program that focuses on mitigation projects. Again, the projects much, must reduce risk to life, property, or critical infrastructure, reduce future losses or damage to life property, again, critical infrastructure and facilities from natural hazards, or improve long-term resilience of community to disasters. Um, and again, they must address sea level risk and climate change. So we have actually, the Office of Emergency Management has coordinated the applications of um, various agencies for this BRIC funding. And here are a few of the projects that number one have been funded or number two are in the final stages of FEMA review. The one that has been funded is a countywide roadway, roadway, excuse me, vulnerability study. And this is a study that to help improve the resiliency of roadways and bridges at risk of flooding and the effects of sea level rise. And this is a countywide study. You know, we talk about the coastline a lot, but even inside, <laughs> inland flooding is also problematic. And we talk about flooding and especially in the peninsulas, um, we wanna make sure that we understand the vulnerabilities of roadways and bridges because that's your lifeline to public safety, um, to recovery, your way out. So we really need to understand the roadways and bridges even more in terms of what the vulnerability is to flooding. The other two are outside the region, the Shady Side and the Sawmill Creek tributaries. But again, it goes into studying the mitigation effects and actions on the land, but also utilizing nature-based solutions. Um, and just thinking of new ways in order to protect our land. So we talk about um, future mitigation projects. This is what we're looking for. Again, um, identified based on potential impacts, critical infrastructure, flood control projects benefiting an entire community or at a high risk area. And unfortunately, and fortunately, these grant programs are competitive, right? It's not only Anne Arundel County, it's the state, it's the country that is experiencing these impacts. And so, um, there's cumulative points and measurements of how is our grant application stacking up against the rest of the country. We talk about personal preparedness, um, flood insurance as something that we're trying to promote more and more. 
um, to help folks who live in the flood zones to be better prepared. Um, and again, there are local floodplain ordinances, FEMA floodplain maps. Um, if you have any questions about the uh, flood insurance program, please feel free to contact my office and we can walk you through that. And the county has been a participant since May, 1983. One of the things I also wanna talk about in terms of disaster resilience, we talk about evacuations. Um, obviously, if it ever came to that, we do have mass care shelters that we update the plan <laughs> annually. Um, we toured the shelters to make sure they're still up to date in terms of providing that temporary housing, first aid, food, water, and even companion animal care. Um, again, it's important that the county be ready in terms of that recovery um, and in terms of that disaster resiliency in the unfortunate um, instance where an evacuation has to be ordered. And of course, getting our alerts. So here are some personal tips that I would be really remiss not to mention. Building a kit, making a plan, knowing your zone, and there's a website for knowing your flood zone or if you are in a flood zone. Um, signing up to receive the alerts from the county. I can't say this enough that with the tornado, with the weather, the alerts you receive are so important. They usually come out days before, and they usually let you know if you read the five print on the National Weather Service on what is to be expected. Take those seriously. If you think if there's a tornado watch, take that seriously. Have a plan in motion. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, well, my phone beeped, but I didn't pay attention or I ignored it. That could be the difference between life and death, especially in a severe tornado weather event scenario. So please sign up for our alerts and be mindful of them. And again, I had to put a plug in for 2025 hazard mitigation plan, especially for this region. The community involvement is key in this and we want to make the plan better and obviously more usable for Anne Arundel County. Again, questions, and here's my contact information, um, at least for the office. Our website has a lot of information. It has a hazard mitigation plan on there. If you want to take a, a quick, I say quick, it's a couple hundred pages, um, our emergency operations plan, and our phone number if you ever have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Tom? Uh, this is Tom Hampton. Um, in terms of your operations center, mm -hmm. is, is there an alternate site uh, if that would be damaged by a hurricane or a tornado? And is that something that gets practiced, um, you know, on a, on a fairly regular basis so that if there was a, a big disaster that sort of wiped out your center, what happens? Where do you go? Yes, we do have alternate sites that do get practiced. Um, in fact, we had to utilize them both during COVID. Um, so yes, the, the question to both of your questions is yes and yes. Okay. Uh, John? Hi, John Spencer. What's the difference or the relationship between the watershed restoration program and the BRIC program? Um, the BRIC program is a federal grant program. Um, and in terms of sometimes BRIC does take into consider watershed, but it's more focused on um, mitigation effects um, that are more um, community resilience, perhaps than watershed, um, which is more heavily focused on land use. Any other Did I understand your question correctly? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Do you have anybody on the line right now? Okay. Pretty, this is Steve Miller. Yes. Your briefing that you provided to us in advance had an awful lot of numbers about all of the emergency calls that are made to 911 and how you handle those calls. What I have not seen though um, is the average response times. And particularly for region four, again, where traffic congestion is an issue. Um, and, and you've got, you know, so many different districts out there, uh, both police and also for fire districts. Are you in region four seeing an increase in response time just simply because of more traffic congestion on the road? And, and I and I know the last study, at least the one I've seen, was done like in 2016. 
I think for, I would have to defer to police. I think that's part of their presentation, if I'm not mistaken. Graham, I don't know if you're on the line. That's correct. I'll address it when uh, it's my turn. Uh, seeing no other questions, I think that's a good segue for Graham, actually. So uh, thank you, uh, Preeti. Uh, and if you do think of questions in advance, again, sound like a broken record, please submit those questions on the Google Doc. Thank you. All right, very good. Is my screen active? Yes, we can see, you, see it and hear you. Okay, very good. Uh, my name is Graham Lange, I'm, or Lang, whichever way you'd like to pronounce it. I'm the strategic planner for the police department. My primary function uh, for the department is to assess and articulate the legitimate need, staffing needs primarily of the department to effectively deliver law enforcement services to the citizens and visitors to Anne Arundel County. Um, plus a lot of uh, additional duties as assigned, um, research related to administrative type of uh, matters. Again, so focusing around uh, staffing. Region four falls within Eastern District. And I just thought I'd show you a map of Eastern District, uh, the patrol posts. I know some of this is outside that area, but pretty, for the most part, it's all contained within Eastern District. Um, and speaking towards the questions uh, that was answered before that, uh, I, I did my best for the Healthy Communities 2040 uh, goals to try to answer something relevant to each of the goals. I'm giving you just a snapshot uh, in this presentation. So for uh, traffic enforcement, um, these were the numbers. You can see that there was a dip uh, in 2020 due to COVID and pick back up for traffic stops and collisions. So I do not, I'm not, a, I wasn't, you didn't give me the answer to the question soon enough. Uh, so I don't have a Eastern District Region Region 4 specific response time, but department wide, our average has been hovering around four, four minutes from, and it's priority one calls only where we can't delay a response. So if it's a uh, serious risk to life, or a serious crime in progress that is considered a priority priority one call and we can't hold them or stack them or any other term you've heard in the past uh, we have to have somebody an officer responding preferably two officers responding and out of those uh, that sampling or the the grouping these are the number of priority one calls that were tested towards that that average. Uh, the next thing I wanted, probably the most important thing, especially from what I do as the strategic planner for the department is to analyze the sworn police officer staffing levels. So right now, as of fiscal year 20, 2022, ending in July, uh, pardon me, June 30th, 2022, we're currently authorized 782 sworn officer positions. Back during COVID, I was able to set aside time to do a categorical analysis of the department unit by unit, uh, district by district, and do an assessment to what I thought I could legitimately articulate on paper to justify the expense of an officer and the number, I, the number that we need is 893, which is significantly higher than what we're authorized. So how we make up for that right now is uh, with overtime. So right now we make up the, the, the shortcoming of, of staffing level with overtime to make it happen. Uh, the next line, not operational medical positions. And what that's about is any officer who is not fully operational, able to do police work as an officer, be in a patrol car, respond to a call. On average, we have 32 officers at any given time that are in this not fully operational uh, condition. And I'm only counting 
uh, 30 or more consecutive days. So someone who has a cold and is out for a couple shifts, I'm not even, I'm nowhere near counting those type of people. I'm trying to be reasonable about it and count uh, significant impacts to uh, staffing needs. Military deployment, same thing, 30, 30 or more consecutive days would not include a reservist who is going on their weekend drill once a month or their two week annual deployment. These people, those individuals are not included. Annually, since 2013, we're, uh, I don't know if the losing is the right way, but really separation, we're, we're, we're having 52 oper officers separate whether they're resigning voluntarily or they're at the end of their 20 year uh, regular, trying to think of the right term, uh, service retirement. But there's also a few officers in there that are, uh, some would call them retreads where they retired from another police department and came to Anne Arundel County Police Department for a few years. So officers in that case, are eligible to retire after five years of service at age 50 or older. So you have a combination that are uh, in the retirement category. So if you do the math and subtract what I have determined is the legitimate need that I believe I can articulate on paper with what we're currently authorized, we're 200 positions short. And, um, for fiscal year 21, we spent approximately $9 million in overtime to fill the staffing needs of the department. As snapshot, as of today, we are, uh, we are staffed with 776 or, and or six vacancies. The real interesting thing that is, I don't think many people really consider out of those that are, have their 20 years service service or five years at, and over age 50, we have 179 officers today that are eligible to retire and walk out the door with a, with a retirement. Uh, strategic planning. The police department, uh, we, we can't have a 20 year uh, or for an operationals point perspective, the chief has decided, and I believe it's a, a legitimate uh, time frame, is every 12 months at the end of each calendar year, uh, as we come up on the end of the year, uh, the chief requests command staff and uh, all employees to submit suggestions on what how we can tweak the operational goals and objectives for the following year. And it's updated. Uh, so as as a problem or a need arises, the direction of the department is is pivoted slightly, and um, to address that need as best we can with the resources that we can. Uh, speaking towards Region Four, uh, one of the healthy communities' goals was uh, to speak about infrastructure. The Eastern District Police, sta Police Station itself was replaced in 2015, so there we're not we're not slotted to request a replacement for it anytime soon. There's no constructive need for it. Um, Again, speaking towards healthy communities, uh, there was a question about warming and cooling centers. So each of the four districts, including Eastern Districts, offers the lobby during uh, extreme weather conditions as a place to, to, for individuals that need to come and cool or warm themselves. Um, I think that's about all I can say on that. Each year, uh, the department seeks to increase the staffing needs of the department to the to the maximum level. It's I'm I'm curious to know what the county executive has in for the police department uh, in his presentation. I believe it's on Thursday, so I look forward to uh, hearing what the the um, county executive has, but. Even if we had a unlimited purse string, 
the number of officer, the number number of qualified and willing applicants is not out there. So our recruiting unit is doing an outstanding job with the resources they have to try to market towards everybody who's qualified and interested. Um, but we need to, we're not, I, I'm concerned that we're not going to uh, meet the, the attrition level of the 52 on average a year uh, level. In regards to kind of a little overview of what's what each of the district does, one of the chief has increased the police and community together officers. Uh, their nickname is the PACT officers. And they are there. Uh, I spoke to a PACT officer early today for, I think it was Northern District. And today they were going out to uh, work in the community on traffic complaints uh, with the traffic coordinator. But they do, uh, if you're not familiar with them, they, they attend community meetings, community events, and they're the, the district, the chiefs and the district commanders uh, uh, representatives at many community uh, level uh, events. And the chief, has increased them from, I believe Eastern was at two and now the chief has, has squeezed out another two uh, packed officers. So for crime, for crime op op operations on a, on a uh, planning level, on a tactical planning level, the command staff meet on a daily basis, whether they're in person sitting at headquarters or on Zoom meetings, uh, the four districts meet and uh, coordinate and uh, describe what's going on in each of the four districts um, um, and try to do their best to formulate a response with the available resources that that's kind of, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm circle talking, but that are available. I will show you in a quick second, um, but uh, the annual report is a plethora of information um, about those goals and objectives. Um, the report is for 2021. It's always completed at the end of the uh, calendar year. Um, and I will show that to you in a second. If you all have specific questions about problems in your neighborhood and the fourth um, in your area, please contact the district. Um, and if you're not a member of the uh, Community Relations Council, please, they've been around for 56 years. They meet once a month. Eastern District meets on one, the third Wednesday every month at, at 7 p.m. Um, and they work and coordinate and uh, with the uh, the commanders of Eastern District. So instead of having to, I will share my, uh, this PowerPoint with, with Eric Ketterling, um, but it's just as simple as just Mar uh, Anne Arundel County Police Department. And for the annual report, it's that simple. It is 99 pages uh, to keep you uh, busy. There is hyperlink, by the way. So if you click on a spot, it'll take you to that, that location. And, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Graham. Are there any questions from anybody this time? Graham, this is John Spencer. i one of those weird people. I look at statistics and I've worked with several police before, like a national right now. But uh, in looking at the statistics are reported to the state of Maryland, the crime rate in Anne Arundel County has been consistently going down about 20 years, violent crimes. But when I look at Prince George's County, Prince George's County now is less than Anne Arundel County. Sorry, sir, you're, you're uh, fading out on me. I heard uh, much of it, but then I didn't hear everything. I'm sorry. Why, why is the crime, violent crime rate in Prince George's County now lower than in Arundel County? 
I wouldn't. Uh, low, so on that on that note, uh, let me. Sure. So, so this is Bo Breeden. I'm actually the Eastern District PCRC Chief Operating Officer for President. And we hold monthly meetings with the community seven o'clock every third Wednesday um, at the Eastern District Station. And this is a question that comes up. There's two things that recently have come up. One, we are in a county entirely of really only a handful of police departments. There's Crofton, Community College, Annapolis City, which was conducted out, and Anne Arundel. PG County also has something like 30 cities and small. Laurel has its own, uh, Ringo has its own, and so you have the cities and jurisdictions. And so you have to wonder if it's PG County Police or the jurisdictions that are reporting it in aggregate or not. And each county does it different. So you have to one, understand how the statistics are being put together. And two, FBI a few years ago switched the major reporting agency that reports crime and the statistics that you compare it to. In Anderson County, currently is undergoing that change this year, or others did it years ago. You cannot compare this year's stats to last year's stats within our county. We just have a whole thing. And previous to other counties right now, until we are fully integrated into the reporting schedule. It's a huge factor in understanding statistics right now. There's a reason Prince George's County went down dramatically after being far higher than Anne Arundel. That is not an aggregate of the entire county anymore, and it's by jurisdiction. And you would have to look in Laurel specifically and add it back in. And Occidental is a separate department. And Gringo is a separate department. And add those in aggregate to determine. So where do they go if you're looking at the state at Maryland.gov and the statistics? They're by county. But, it, but, they, but not all. You may need to break it down into each of the different. So Hyperville would have gone where, for example? You can usually look up Annapolis is listed separately than the county in most reports in the past. So. They're making changes that are ongoing. Okay. It's making that they basically said like you're going to have anomalies here because they're using different reporting systems too. They, they need to classify certain crimes differently than previous, so it's very hard to compare new versus old priority one calls. And that was just a you know they, they just went over that about three months ago because the county was making those changes. Very difficult to make the assessments. I send you the link. Yeah, for the report, you can take a look at that. Because yeah. I sent, I sent we, it to two people in Anne Arundel County, three in Prince George's County, and nobody answered. Because nobody they, did answer. Well, right, because well, statistically, they're not using the same thing. So please, I'd be interested. Please send it to Graham. Dot Lange L N G E at a a county dot org, and I will look into it. Okay. But he's absolutely right. So we are in a transition period of switching from uh, UCR uh, summary reporting of incidents, which would take the most serious event crime that occurred in an incident and report that. The new, the new uh, FBI reporting is called NIBRS, and I'm sorry, I can't quote you what the uh, what NIBRS stands for, the, ac the acronym, but it's going to put us in influx, uh, just as he said. We, we will probably, it's, it's hard to say how my next year's annual report for 2022 is going to look. Well, one, we're in the middle of the transition, which will segment the year, but also the numbers may bounce around all over the place. So um, going up and down in Anne Arundel County. Sorry, you were a little muffled on me. I, I, I might have covered you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So the bottom line is, the question is still, is crime going up or down in Anne Arundel County? Well, it, it's... Violent crime. Uh, so I'm 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 trying to I'm sorry I'm one that overanalyzes questions and I'm trying to completely understand your question. So if we look at this is the crime table for 2021 and looking back at 2020, and they're depending on your perspective, they're relatively close or they're not. 
So crimes against person, they're relatively close. Crimes against property, we have there were less. Okay, it becomes violent crime. Violent crime is defined in multiple ways. So then you have to break that out. I'm just talking about a singular database, and I would that. hope that people, well, I would hope that all the counties use the same standards. You know, that's the problem. And we're moving to what the other counties are doing. We're not comparing the same apples and apples. And that's why we're moving. So even Anne Arundel trend is not consistent. The trend is consistent in the old model. The new model is going to change the trend line because it's a change of statistics and classification of crimes. Not all priority one crimes would be the same in both models. So you can't compare the two. You'd have to go back and add it in individually. And you like stats, like I like stats. And I sat down and tried to read it all, and it's unless you have the raw data somewhere, it'll be impossible to figure it out. But so I, the way I, three to five years, you know. So I believe that that's yeah. what the FBI was attempting to do with NIBRS. It was to standardize and make sure that data and crime information was not lost by just reporting summary information because you could have a homicide that had a litany of other uh, crimes associated with it but the only thing that would be reported is the homicide and what NIBRS is is if I understand what NIBRS' objective is, is to, to have everything in there. So let's, let, on this note, so, so I, have the, I have the annual report up now. So this is a uh, calls for service table. Graham, I don't want to put, put you on the spot now. Can I just send you an email later on? Yeah, you can, no, please, by all means, by all means. All right, thanks, Graham. Uh, I know we're running a little late. Uh, so we have one more presentation to go through. Uh, so last but not least, we have the fire department. Yes. Hey, good, e good evening. Well, I'm going to share my screen here. And get this up and running. Okay. So can everybody see that? I hope. Yes. Great. So I'm Deputy Chief Ross Dinkle. I'm here on behalf of uh, Fire Chief Trish Wolford, who sends her regrets that she couldn't attend tonight. She likes to do these things in uh, in person or virtually in person, um, but I, she was busy tonight, so she tasked me with doing this. I'll try to keep it short and sweet, but informative, so as not to uh, use up too much more of your valuable time. Um, so I want to spend a few minutes. We're going to talk about the fire department in general. Uh, I'm going to talk about how the fire department is trying to meet the plan 2040 um, healthy communities goals and we'll talk about region four specifically um, when we get there so i'll just run through this slide deck and we can talk and answer questions afterwards if you'd like okay fire department big overview who are we well we're 932 career firefighters all of our career firefighters have some type of um, medical certification, either EMTB, which is Emergency Medical Technician Basic, or EMTP, um, which is EMT um, Paramedic. We have 285 paramedic clinicians out of those 932 firefighters. We currently have about not, uh, 324 operational volunteer firefighters. Those are firefighters that are maintaining their certifications, training and qualifications to actually respond on calls and provide service. Um, we also have 28 fire communications operators. So we 911 comes into the police side, a call for service. If it's fire or ambulance, it gets transferred over to our communications center where those 28 uh, fire communication operators um, take the call information, dispatch the call and monitor the, the tactical um, radio communications for those incidents. We also have 31 civilians that do support functions throughout the department at various different levels. So where we are, we're 31 fire stations. 22 of those are county-owned buildings and nine are volunteer-owned buildings. All 31 fire stations have uh, career firefighters assigned to them, regardless of the status of the ownership of the building. If you look off to the right, you'll see the map of our 31 different um, first due areas. Each one of those stations has a first due area based upon um, travel times and distances. They can get to that area quicker than the, the next nearest station. What do we do? Well, we you see, we dispatched over 91,000 incidents um, last year. Now, we dispatched for Anne Arundel County and Annapolis City. Uh, we, Anne Arundel County responded to just about 82,000 
uh, emergency calls for services in 2021. We transported tens of thousands of patients to the hospitals. And we are, our folks have logged more than 57,000 hours of training last year. So region four, um, it, it's actually the, the region with the most fire stations in it. It has eight different fire stations. Uh, you can see them, um, the, the Jacobsville, Early Heights, Rivera Beach, Arnold, Cape St. Clair, Lakeshore, Jones Station, Arminger. Um, so that's at the whole two peninsulas over there. Um, you can see that not necessarily, you'll see that like the border stations, even though the fire station is, is well, the 30 is over here, and we're not just pulling resources to respond to a call just from this station area. We're pulling them from other areas either. We're, we're, the fire department is a dynamic organization. What do I mean by that? Well, our resources aren't static. Medical and fire suppression units are deployed throughout the county based upon the call volume at any given time. So we're, we're constantly moving resources around to keep to, to meet the, the demands for the, the incidents, but also to keep service as equal as we can throughout the rest of the county by redeploying resources, moving them around, asking our volunteers to come in and, and, and put additional units in service, calling our mutual aid partners to fill um, vacant uh, stations where there's gaps in our service delivery because they're out of incidents. So we're, we're a very dynamic um, organization that moves around a lot. We're on the street, we use automatic vehicle locators to help us pick the, the closest unit appropriate unit for the call type. So we get our resources there as quickly as possible. Um, what else? So region four call volume. So you can see our average response time from in, in region four is five minutes and 50 seconds. Um, that's from the time that the stations are alerted to the time that the first unit arrives on location. Um, these are for all priority calls. So our priority one calls versus our priority um, three calls. So we're going lights. Some are some are going lights and sirens. Some are going non-emergency based upon the call type. You, you, Region four has a very large call volume of those eighty-two thousand calls. Almost fifteen and a half thousand of those were in the region two area last year. And of those, you can see there was almost thirteen thousand EMS calls, almost twenty-five hundred fire calls, some nine hazmat, seventy-four rescues, and one service call. So how are we trying to meet our plan 2040 um, goals? Well, we're building a couple, a couple of replacement fire stations. We want to make sure that our folks are in adequate um, modern buildings. And in addition to that, we're, we're building more capacity in these newer fire stations, adding additional bays, which will allow us to expand our fleet and add service as, as funding and, uh, allows type of deal. So Jacobsville, this, this is our new fire station 10. It's a replacement station. It just went in service three weeks ago. Um, we've been waiting for that for a while. Um, our next one is our Cape St. Clair fire station, station 19. That's replacing an older building um, with a new four bay fire station. It's gonna include public meeting space. So part of the Healthy Communities Goals, HC1, was community facilities and services will meet the needs of all residents. Well, we're building our, we're trying to, to bring the community back to the fire station. We're going to put community um, spaces in our fire stations to allow the community to use this public space for meetings and such. Got to control this thing better, huh? So some of the other fire stations that are going in the plan uh, that are outside of um, Region 4 is the Rundle, um, Crownsville, and the Wall Chapel fire stations. Uh, we're also going to be building a new modern fire training facility. The building that we are currently in was remodeled in 1988, which happens to be the year that I was hired. And prior to that was built in the 60s. So it's, it's been a long time coming. Um, the department has grown leaps and bounds since that, the, that uh, fire training academy was built. It was built to support approximately 500 folks. Well, now we have almost a thousand career and, and another 500 or 400 volunteers. Um, again, our our healthy community policies talk about a plan for the construction of a modern training facility that reflects the needs of a modern fire and emergency medical services. What else are we doing? Um, uh, consolidated 911 center. Right now, as I, I talked about earlier, the police have the actual 911 center. Um, if it's fire or ambulance, it comes over to us. If it's police, it stays over at them over there. So by consolidating, the thought is, and it will happen, this is the model that the industry around the country is going to is it's all in one place. It's less personnel needed to, 
to uh, to manage that. There's there's a time lag between the transfer of the call, which will no longer happen because it'll all happen in one center. Um, okay, we're also making sure we have the appropriate people, both civilian and and uh, uniform folks, to make sure we meet the, the demands and the needs of the citizens. Uh, we've, we've added a new human resource management. We've added a new position in the field to help better um, manage incidents, our shift commander position. Uh, we're, we're improving our uh, CPR AED instructor specialist programs. And, and actually we just started a new recruit school to help uh, fill some of our vacancies. It just started this past February. So that's pretty much the department. Uh, a quick overview and how we're trying to meet the plan 2040 goals. Um, and I'll answer any questions or try to at least um, that you may have. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions from the SAC? All right, seeing none, uh, I guess uh, if you guys do think of anything, let us uh, send it again on the Google Doc and we will submit it and um, we'll go from there. So thank you again, Ross, and appreciate your patience. Sure. Uh, so just to wrap up tonight, I know we're, we're past time. Um, there were a couple of things. We, uh, the, the whole point of this tonight was a whole lot of information. And we gave you a whole lot of background information uh, to really kind of your homework, to really get this, this topical uh, stuff going. And this is all feeding into the recommendations for the, the plan. Uh, so on the screen here, we have kind of just a broad definition or a definition of goals and strategies uh, and what they are and what, what they're aiming to do. Um, so and I, I will send this and you guys will have access to this tomorrow as well. But essentially, when you start thinking of different recommendations and different ideas of, of what you've heard tonight, um, any gaps that may not that may need to be addressed or you have ideas on, on certain things re regarding uh, the economic um, status of the region four, you really kind of think, tie, try to tie it to, to, to the goals and strategies um, and really let put that on that Google doc and have that conversation with everybody here and all your SAC members, because that document is really what's going to help write this plan. Uh, so your input is absolutely vital and, and it's key to really help make this plan a success. Um, we were supposed to have kind of a little breakout session. I think we're, we're past time on that. Uh, but uh, if you guys want to uh, just kind of maybe spitball a few ideas right now, like what, what have you learned tonight? Uh, were there any strategies that you can recommend for, uh, from all this that, to really help with the goals specific to Region 4 as it relates to um, the public facilities and the economy? Um, and is there anything, again, is there anything specific that you can, that you've learned tonight that, that you, you think could be built off of, Bo? So that's, that's perfect. That's great. Uh, so the, those kind of ideas and, and those thoughts, please share that on that Google Doc so all of us can read it at any time. And, and maybe, you know, you'll read it tonight or think about tonight, but then in three days, you'll come up with something to build off of that. Put that idea down so we can continue that conversation and really get that get this like brain process moving forward. And we'll do this for each topical meeting moving forward. Um, just a few other th quick things. Uh, you guys have been great at updating uh, this uh, the sheet. Uh, so please continue to do that uh, as you continue to do your outreach efforts. Uh, and then finally, just a few important dates. The feedback map is still gonna be active through June 9th. Um, the, the next meeting date is gonna be May 23rd. Uh, it's gonna discuss transportation and land use. This is Front of Park Library. Uh, we're gonna have another 
for one June 6th, about two weeks after that, to continue that conversation. Because as we all know, transportation is a, is a doozy. It's, it's a big topic. So we wanted to uh, help break that up a little bit. Um, and thanks to Bo's suggestion at last meeting, we're actually going to start incorporating the Eastern District Police Station uh, meeting room up there. I, I believe we have a meeting up there at the end of June. Uh, so the next two meetings will be at the Severna Park Library, and then we'll go up to the Eastern District Police Station, and then probably back down here. Um, just continue these three, uh, say, um, these, these three buildings for our meetings. Uh, now, if, you, if, if, if that's okay with everybody here, I think that's, um, we, we kind of decided that on, on just geographic and, and kind of fairness for everybody to have equal access to each, each meeting if they so choose to attend in person. Uh, the goals and policies sheet, again, please use that. And then finally, just a quick quick note, on May 3rd next week, uh, county staff is going to be doing a, a mini tabling event at the community college. So if you have any, if you know any students, faculty, anybody that, that is at the school, please tell them to stop by. I, I believe it's going to be at the, the, the cafeteria. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think we're going to send a, a communication out this week about that. So, and we just got the, we just found out about this. So this is new. Uh, so uh, we're moving forward with that. Um, and other than that, again, contact information. And thank you all for hanging out with me 15 minutes later. And uh, yes, Steve? Yeah, Eric, can you just quickly tell us about how many people participated in the noon session and how many participated in the six o'clock session on the April 20th? Sure. Uh, I think we had about, what, 40 in the noon? Yeah, about 40 at noon and about 30 at 6 p.m. And, and some of those were probably the same. People. There were only a, a handful that had the same, the same people. So, yeah, and thank you for bringing that up. We have, uh, I hope you all are able to watch the, the public forum. If not, it's on the hub sites now. So it, I would just recommend kind of looking that over and sharing that with everybody as well. So. We need a motion to adjourn. Anybody second? Second. Anybody, everybody wants to leave. <laughs> 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 <laughs>